Pray with me, please, friends. Guide us, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we would see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover a true peace that transcends and surpasses all of our understanding. For it is in the mighty, the marvelous, and the matchless name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, I feel as if I must begin this morning with an apology. I've been unofficially diagnosed with a man cold. For those of you that don't know what a man cold is, it's just a regular head cold. But I'm just such a wimp that I just want to drink a bottle of NyQuil and wake up on Thursday. But alas, it is Advent 1. And it is so good to be with you this morning. My guess is that many of you over the last several days spent long and loving moments with family. This is a season of family. Family parties and family get-togethers, family name draws and family white elephant exchanges, this is a wonderful time of the year when we can come together as families. But what if I told you that Jesus, too, had a family? And like us, Jesus would have undoubtedly spent lots of time with his family, especially around the seasons of the festivals where Jesus' family would have gathered and they would have shared meals and laughter and love with one another. And undoubtedly, this time of year, the different dynamics within our families are only heightened. And so I thought it would be right and fitting for us to look at Jesus' family tree and by discovering some of the branches in Jesus' family tree, perhaps some of the branches in our family trees might experience a bit more love and reconciliation as well. And so this morning I'm going to share with you a passage of Scripture that, as I have alluded to before, you have never, ever heard a sermon preached on these 17 verses. Because, to be honest... They're just a long, long list of names. Names that are related to our Savior. So I invite you to do what you need to do best to listen most carefully to the word of the Lord. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham. And Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconia, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconia was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel, the father of 
Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Elazor, and Elazor the father of Mathen. Mathen was the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of, Je- of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who bore the son Jesus, who is the Messiah. Thus the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And the generations from David to the deportation to Babylon are 14 generations. And the generations from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah are 14 generations. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No, stop, stop. Oh my goodness. Stop, 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 stop. Stop, stop. stop. Matthew 1, 1 through 17. Friends, it is not just a long list of names. There is wonderful gospel teaching for us in these words. And one of the cultural insights that's lost is that in the ancient world, your family was an extremely big deal, perhaps even more than it is here. Who your family was the stock you came from had large implications on your economic, on your social, on your entire livelihood. In fact, how we understand God is oftentimes in context of family, in relationship. We understand God as Father, Son, and Spirit in relationship with one another. How many times do you read the Bible and you'll come across a phrase like this, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, or so-and-so was father to this person, or father to that person, or son to this person. Family was an extremely big deal in the ancient world. And it's true for us today, isn't it? Our family is a really, really big deal. Who we come from, our stock, our lineage, our people, who we come from plays an enormous impact on who we are this morning. How we deal with love and loss. How we handle possessions and money. The way we forgive or perhaps don't forgive. Oftentimes these things are connected and we can trace them back to a larger family system which is to say that our families help develop us, who we are. Our families help develop us. We can oftentimes look back and trace the lines in your family that so-and-so looks like great-grandpa, or so-and-so is very musical, just like grandma was. Our families help develop us. And so perhaps... This morning, this season, is a time for us to reflect back on our families. On our children, our grandchildren, go back a few generations. Our parents, our grandparents, even our great-grandparents. Reflect on our families. I've been doing a lot of that the past several days. Uh, uh, Yesterday, my grandfather passed away and went home to glory. And I can see so much of my life is impacted by his life. Our families help develop us. And so maybe this is a time of year when we can pause and we can reflect on our families. Are we loving our families the way we truly want to love them? Or maybe there is a relationship within our families where there's tension, friction, division, and now's the time pick up the phone, send the email, write the text, grab the cup of coffee, bury the hatchet, and extend the olive branch to peace because in the whole scheme of things, is it really that big of a deal? Our families help develop us, my friends. And when we look back in our families, there's no right or wrong answer. The only wrong answer, perhaps, is to not acknowledge that our families play a huge role in the people that we are. They help develop us. But our families do not define us. 
Each and every one of us has been uniquely and gifted and amazingly created in the image of God with our own unique skills and gifts, which is to say that some of the pain that we can and have experienced in the past with our families, that does not have to be the present reality for us this morning. The cycles that we can trace back a few generations, addiction, divorce, pains, challenges, that can stop with us this morning. Our families help develop us, but they do not define us. Now, how about Jesus' family? His royally broken family tree. One of the things, upon a closer look in the long genealogy of Jesus, is that there are some really, really bad guys. Don't think for one second that Jesus' relatives are saintly. Nothing could be further from the truth. Take for a moment Ahaz. Ahaz was a really, really bad guy. He murdered members of his own family. He practiced pagan worship. He got himself into trouble and then had the Assyrians buy him out of trouble. Ahaz was a really bad guy. So was Manasseh. Ouch, Manasseh. Manasseh, not a good guy. He too did unthinkable acts with members in his own family. Practiced cultural genocide and consulted spiritual mediums in pagan worship. Or Rehoboam. Rehoboam was not a good guy either. His rule can be described as a loss of about half of the entire kingdom and a um, moving the moral compass in unhealthy directions, a loss of integrity. Rehoboam was not a good guy. And so the pastoral point that I obviously want to share with us this morning, that each of us need to hear, is that all of our families are broken. All of them. It does not matter, my friends, how nice we look on the outside, the homes we live in, the schools we went to, or the economic status we find ourselves in, each and every one of our families has a broken branch, at least one. Each and every one of our families has a Manasseh. And maybe you're the Manasseh. <laughs> and that's okay. Because all of our families are broken and all of our families are still tethered and connected to Jesus. You know, one of the cool things that I love about the genealogy is that these individuals are named. You know, they're not skipped over. They're not brushed under the rug as if they would somehow taint the holiness and the purity of Jesus. No, Ahaz and Manasseh and Rehoboam, they're named. And I think if we were honest, when we look at our own families, some of the things that, you know, we're just, we're not proud of. Maybe it brings us shame. Maybe it brings us embarrassment. And we would just assume just not, not deal with that side of the family. But the fact that these characters and these individuals are named reminds me that there is hope and possibility for redemption in their families and in our families, my friends. There is opportunity for hope and redemption when we can name it, when we can speak the truth in love. So take heart to know that each and every one of our families while may have a few broken branches, are still connected to the family tree of the only sinless person to ever walk the face of the earth. But there's one more thing I want to share about the family tree of Jesus. 
the royally broken family tree. And that is the royalty of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah describes Jesus as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. But make no mistake about it, my friends, the people that were waiting for Jesus were looking for a king. They were looking for a king to go toe-to-toe with the Romans. They were looking for a king to overthrow the oppressive powers of the day. They were looking for a king to restore equilibrium to a group of people that were marginalized and silenced and pushed away. They were looking for a king, all right. But what they found was not what they were expecting. They found a king. A king not draped in royal purple, but a king wrapped in swaddling clothes. They were looking for a king to be surrounded by the most brilliant advisors and strongest leaders. And they find a king next to cows, goats, and sheep. This is the king they find. Dear friends, as we begin this Advent journey of waiting and preparation, may we be mindful of the kind of king and the kind of kingdom this king comes to establish. One that says, if you want to be first, be last. If you want to be strong, be weak. This is our king who comes from a family tree much like ours, full of broken branches, longing for redemption, savoring the grace that God gives us. And friends, at this table, we are reminded of God's grace in the bread and in the cup, where by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are united to Christ. And all are welcome to experience God's lavish love and mercy at this table. Would you please join with me in the great prayer of thanksgiving printed in your bulletin? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Pray with me, please. Holy and right it is and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God, you created the heavens with all its host and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love by sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing to the glory of your name. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in anticipation of his coming again, accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the very communion of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, and grant that being joined together with you, we may obtain to the unity of the faith 
and grow up into all things into Christ Jesus our Lord. And as these grains have been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered into your kingdom. Even so, come, and come soon, Lord Jesus. So with the confidence of the children of God, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And on the night in which Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest friends, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body that is given for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he poured it and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood that is shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Friends, as a gesture of hospitality, once the bread is distributed, you may partake. And when the cup is passed, you can hold on to it and we will celebrate the sacrament of the cup as one body in Christ. Friends, all things are now ready.